Good morning. Thank you, that, that helps. <laughs> my primary ambition in being here today is to have you fall in love with Michael Faraday. So, picture a bar magnet, an object whose peculiar structure is organized such that the bar emanates an invisible force. But how do we know? We know because the British scientist Michael Faraday had the courageous imagination, as Einstein put it, to recognize that the invisible space between objects, not the objects themselves, might best explain our physical world. But how do we know? We know we can drop that bar magnet into a pile of iron filings and watch the bits organize along very specific lines. Faraday called these lines of force. But the iron bits and lines are not the force itself. They're an indicator, a representation, a map of the invisible phenomenon that Faraday ultimately named field in 1845. The Earth, a giant magnet itself, emanates its own vast field. But how do we know? A compass needle invisibly guided by its tiny magnet tells us as it points north. So I am here to talk about a way of understanding things we can't see, a way of knowing. I am a science enthusiast, but I am not a scientist. I'm a product designer, an architect, a writer, and a teacher. But in 1992, after years of teaching and architecture, I returned to school to study product design and engineering, where science became a magnet for me. But it wasn't always attraction. At first, it was a love-hate relationship. Loves me, loves me not. The engineering classes were a jolt. I realized I'd been using fundamental concepts like the Pythagorean theorem without ever understanding their physical meaning. In fact, I realized that without being able to touch or visualize these ideas, I was failing, lost in a myriad of more complex subjects like electronics. I kept thinking if teachers had drawn physics for me in high school, I might have sailed through mechanical analysis in college. A squared plus B squared equals C squared might have been drawn for me, not as numbers in a right triangle, but as a relationship between gravity, the direction of down, and the horizon, the direction of across, as the polymath Jacob Bernowski suggested in The Ascent of Man. Every time I turned around, there it was, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, every class I was taking. And what does it mean? Squared. Did you ever ask? When I was in graduate school, I decided the world was made up on the one side of students who happily accept the abstraction of math and science, memorize what they need to, and move on. The other half, the rest of us poor schmucks can't get past first base because we are obsessed with squared, or sine waves, or what about differential equations? What is that? Bernowski was trying to tell us that symmetry isn't just nice, and numbers are not simply abstractions. The Pythagorean theorem, the most important in mathematics, and the right triangle as the numerical form of our visual world is how we experience the world. The right triangle, when rotated four times, illustrates the basis of our navigation on Earth, another map. It is a lens through which we experience and construct our world. Think of the carpenter square. It's also the geometric square. So back to that. It turns out that squared is square. Who knew? I can't tell you how excited I was to discover this at 30-something. It was the first time in my life that I wasn't simply trying to survive math. I actually found it beautiful, and I was beginning to understand geometry as a map of space. And I was constructing an understanding of what might be fundamental in life. I was heartened again recently by the acclaimed biologist E.O. Wilson, who, in his 2012 TED Talk, confessed that he finally got around to learning calculus at 30-something as a tenured professor at Harvard, while sitting in class next to his own evolutionary biology students. Being back in school at 30-something was pivotal. It was more than just the issue of extraordinary cost. It was about time and not wasting it. It was about repairing my early education, and it was about finding a missing confidence. 
Since all of my classes zoomed past my fundamental questions, I had to teach myself in order to catch up. Like the Pythagorean theorem, I worked with metaphors, drawings, animations, because I knew how to do that. You might be asking why a product designer should care quite so much. I was working on things I think about, but not things I have been educated to think about. And I was working on product design, engineering, ergonomics, material science, making stuff. But in that graduate education, I was formulating what I tell my students they must do. I was figuring out what I valued. I share a creed with writer Alan Gerganus, who says, I believe in Whitman's vision that we are all composed of a thousand voices. Product designers are not experts in any domain. We are not educated to be experts in any particular thing, except process for everything. We develop a discrete set of skills that enable thinking in situations, as the artist Joseph Albers would explain. We think through a problem ethnographically, ergonomically, with our whole bodies, even kinesthetically, in order to be one with the phenomenon. So I was a designer thinking about science, and I began to envision a way to use analogies in three-dimensional form to explain abstract ideas, first for myself, then children. I knew that childhood is where confidence breaks down first. I believed then, as I do now, that there is no reason why so many seemingly intangible concepts have to wait for high school. The, these three-dimensional forms became prototypes of books, not bound on the left, not pop-up, but really three-dimensional, mechanical, magnetic. In these books, I was exploring every fundamental idea I could, everything that confused me, from atomic structure to the science of color, I kept looking for the most foundational place to begin, to prepare me for more complex ideas. At the same time, field theory and string theory were in the news, much the way the Higgs boson is today. And I was taken with this word field. Maybe it was because at the same time I was planting my first wildflower field. I kept thinking, surely the etymology was not accidental. So I started digging. And this is when I fell in love with Michael Faraday. One account suggests that his use of the word came from the word a field, meaning action at a distance or away from home. I began to understand field as a base concept, a type of glue holding the universe together. How much smaller, more abstract, and more invisible could I go? So the next generation of prototypes focused on fields and was part of a series tested with children across the US. I experimented with all sorts of tangible ways to demonstrate this wildly elusive concept including widgets and magnetic fluids shown here on the right. On approach, the sliding magnet stops the rotating dial by turning the fluid to solid. Retracting the magnet returns the solid to fluid. Again, that peculiar internal structure. So what is a feel, really? In its simplest form, it's a distribution of unique physical values at each point in space. Remember this from high school? the Cartesian graph with an x and y axis? Well, it's actually useful for thinking about fields because we can imagine this plane stretching infinitely out into space with different values, coordinates. It's like a street map with a corner of Maine and College as really a different place than Maine and Washington. Maine and College might be a higher elevation than Maine and Washington. The wind may be blowing in a different direction at a different velocity. The temperature may be different. The street map is a Cartesian graph mapping different points in space that have some invisible features like wind fields and temperature fields. Fields are almost always three-dimensional. They can be disturbed, further changing values at different points. Fields often have a source like the sun reaching out in all directions to affect surrounding points in space. Imagine a field of sunflowers. When there is wind, sunflowers will bend in the direction of the wind. If we use arrows on paper to map the magnitude and direction of the bending of each sunflower, then we have a vector field and a wind velocity field. If the wind stops, the source is gone, the bending stops. But the sunflowers, they're still there. They are a field as points in space. Then I thought about the name sunflower, helianthus, and the heliotropic behavior of sunflowers, heads rotating towards the sun, 
responding to its electromagnetic field. I focused on the sunflower field as metaphor for a long time, looking so closely at it, almost kinesthetically. And I don't think it was inconsequential that while I was in graduate school, I dreamt that I was an actual variable inside an equation. That was really weird. The famous geneticist and Nobel laureate Barbara McClintock described her way of understanding the microscopic chromosomes of corn. I found that the more I worked with them, the bigger and bigger they got. I was part of the system, right down there with them, able to see the internal parts of the chromosomes. The physicist Richard Feynman was characterized as having physical intuition, ascribing physical sensations to abstract symbols of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic field like enacting the motion of an arrow. Research conducted by the Center for Children and Technology found that young women longed for a more intuitive understanding of invisible theories, asking for tools to let them become one with the phenomena so that they could understand it from the inside out as active participants, feeling the collision of atoms. I decided I wanted that too. And with a team of faculty, students, and scores of advisors from around the US, we created a project to develop ideas for immersive environments that map invisible phenomena. Faraday called himself an experimentalist, and he understood there is nothing quite like being there. The most important thing that we did as a team was to come up with what we called field principles. It was our in, in, whoop, it was our intellectual glue, the thing that kept us on the same page as we were moving through this. Remember, we were not just scientists. We were designers. We were people in education. We were people in architecture, uh, product design. So we had to have an intellectual glue. So fields exist everywhere, it turns out. So you can imagine that this is, in fact, a plane that carries on through space indefinitely. And fields can be disturbed, as I said. So anytime we move through space, or anytime we send something through space, we are in fact disturbing that space. And disturbances, they travel as waves through fields. And they carry information and data. When you talk on the cell phone, you are sending out information. And that is going through a permanent electromagnetic field. So we developed ideas for metaphorical fields to help kids make a leap to the more complex electromagnetic field. It's not easy. Not easy to figure it out, not easy for them. For example, a wind field that allows you to get closer to the phenomena of speed and direction, or a sound field that allows you to visualize the speed of sound with actual sound and light. Imagine a field of elements that respond to both sound from a distance and up close. This is a proposal for an urban rooftop using microphones and LEDs to map sound waves traveling out across a city. What does it physically mean that sound travels at 1,125 feet per second? How fast is that? We wanted to know. We set out for a quick test on a local landing strip with spun aluminum forms, LEDs, and lots of wire. That is the speed of sound. And this was my second most exciting moment after squared. There we were, standing on the airfield, all puns intended, clapping wildly as if we had all just seen a sound wave. But really, we had seen a representation, but we were no less transfixed. Einstein was motivated his whole life by Michael Faraday's field, which he considered to be the greatest contribution to the scientific spirit. Faraday's breakthrough was conceptual, physical, and daring, but he was criticized for his lack of mathematics education. Throughout this project, I've struggled with some opinions in the world of science education whose greatest concern is misconception. To those I say, 
your misconception may be my next big idea. Thank you.